Chen Jiwei is one of China's new entrepreneurs. He also wants to preserve and pass on his traditional roots. Yun De Li called China Chopin. Da Da, who is six years old, is the youngest student in Yun De Li's master class. 最大的期望啊，首先就是开心。好好弹琴，好好弹琴，让妈妈开心的快乐每一天。Mao Ji Hung is the founder of a local clothing design company in Guangzhou. In 2013, his company Exception became famous when he was chosen to design clothes for China's first lady, Madame Peng Liuyuan, in her diplomatic appearances. We believe that we all can control this era. To realize the Chinese dream, China must be a civilization state. That's China's claim. And it means China must revive the essence and energy of its 5,000-year-old culture, inculcate these Chinese values into modern life while integrating the best global methods and practices. China has become an economic superpower. But commercial success and material prosperity, though remarkable and required, are not sufficient to fulfill the Chinese dream. For the Chinese people, China's civilization must play a central role. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn. I wrote the book How China's Leaders Think. I have visited almost every province, experiencing China's diversities, exploring China's changes. I follow the Chinese dream. In this episode of China's Challenges, I ask: Is China's civilization meaningful today? Does China's civilization matter? How to understand the essence of a civilization? Experience it yourself. Zhou Mendu is a Tai Chi master, the fifth generation successor of Yang Tai Chi, and the establisher of Tai Chi Jiu Jitsu. He learned Chinese martial arts in Ho Yuan Jiao style. My exploration of the dream of Chinese civilization starts with Master Zhou. 脚钉起来。Joshi Fu， 你好。Hello， <laughs> American。我是美国人 ，I am an American。我很喜欢学习中国文化，我很喜欢学习中国呃文明，我很喜欢中国功夫。Very good <laughs>。我们中国文化一笔一画，中国功夫一招一式，都要从规矩做起。我今天是告你最基本的一招。With globalization and the internet creating a worldwide culture, is China's culture relevant for China's development? Here's the historical complexity. A half century ago, extreme leftism sought to destroy Chinese culture and traditional values. Then the market economy undermined extreme leftism, but left a moral vacuum. Now, Chinese culture and values have returned, especially Confucianism. Can this provide a moral compass? 
Some Chinese people are beginning to seek their national roots and cultural identity. Chen Jiuwei is one of China's new entrepreneurs. He built his successful chemical business from the ground up. After 10 years of hard work, he has more than 200 employees. Traditional teachings are part of his business model. Chin lives in a Shanghai suburb with his wife and three young children. He wants his kids to study in the United States. He knows firsthand the importance of English for international business. Uh, My mother is talking to... Chin hired a tutor to give his children extra training in English. Okay, cool. Which other country do you like to visit? To go to... I like to go to America. Because... It's so funny. It's funny? America is funny? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. Australia best. But Chin Wei also wants to preserve and pass on his traditional roots. Chin's feet are in two worlds. Uh, so this year, Chin and his son are going on a journey, following the Pilgrim Trail. Through Fudan University, they are taking a class in traditional Chinese culture, led by Professor Zhang Zhao Li. I think our culture is not just an emotional phenomenon. It is a symbol of our culture returning. For the past 100 years, we have been studying and studying in the West. We have been doing school teachers. But we are always in a self-centered position. This is Chufu, Shandong province, where Confucius is said to have been born 2,500 years ago. Tourists and seekers flock here to experience traditional thought and practices. Many of Chin's classmates are also successful entrepreneurs and social elite, like 52-year-old Yao Lan. To prepare for the upcoming worship of ancestors, they change into traditional costumes. Chibong,其实我很久以前都想来学习国学,但是一直没有机会,因为以前都忙于事业嘛,啊,但是最近几年的那个事业比较稳定了,所以说,呃,重新圆,那个,那个梦想。这是爸爸送给你的礼物啊
held on Mount Ni in the Great Hall of the Confucius Temple, in front of a cave where it said Confucius was born. Uh 呃, 不光是赚钱 我发现除了赚钱做好企业的话那么从我们国学当中China's traditional culture is resurging. Parents are enrolling their children in special classes. Traditional Chinese learning is entering primary and middle schools. In today's China, respecting traditional culture is said to be part of the core values of Chinese socialism. It means little, however, if people don't put these values into practice. Traditional Chinese studies explore the country's essence. These core values inherent in Chinese culture help the country achieve rejuvenation and prosperity. Good, 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 good. Through, first. Uh, one, through, uh, two, first. Uh, 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 我用中国的打法 during the 19th century, Western armies forced China to open its doors, and Western products swept through Chinese markets. During the 1980s, China's doors again opened to the world. But this time, along with Western products, Western culture and lifestyle entered as well. The result was that Chinese culture and lifestyle began to fade. 
culture conservatives blame current problems of Chinese society on this invasion of Western culture. But why call contemporary culture Western? Call it modern. Like the market, the West has no monopoly on modern culture. In the marketplace of ideas, what people prefer shall flourish. Moreover, amalgamation is relentless. Whether Chinese or Western, modern or traditional, diverse cultural elements combine to create a fresh, vibrant, contemporary Chinese culture. Take this soft drink as an example. Its global brand used to represent American pop culture. But now its logo and labels have been replaced by trendy Chinese slang. This is a gao. Other Coke bottles brand the person drinking it as a hipster, a dreamer, a girl who stays home watching cartoons, or a person from a dog planet. What wonderful blending of cultures, this fusion of West and East, each affecting the other in a multipolar world. Classical music is a case in point. This iconic symbol of Western civilization is being embraced in China. I visit Shanghai's Pingnan Elementary School. Their brass orchestra is rehearsing for a citywide competition. Over half the students here are in the orchestra. All are fans of Western classical music. Lan Zhihui is 11 years old. Her grandfather studied Chinese traditional instruments, but she chose to play Western instruments. Yeah. Bravo. That's very Thank good. Very <laughs> good. So tell me about the clarinet and why you picked the clarinet Western instrument, not Chinese instruments. Because I think Western instrument is amazing. <laughs> why amazing? I enjoy it very much. Why? Because I think music is my, uh, is my life. Oh. My mother chose uh, piano and uh, my teacher chose uh, clarinet. Oh, and you agreed? Yeah. And you're happy they made that decision? Yeah. It's a beautiful instrument. Mm. This national passion for Western classical music has captivated a nation and created a generation of world-class musicians. Yun De Li called China's Chopin, won fame abroad at 18, winning the prestigious International Chopin Piano Competition in Warsaw. The youngest person and the only Chinese to win first prize. The first prize is the one that two. He He now devotes his extraordinary talent to promoting Western classical music.
It's good that Chinese gifted artists like Yun Du Li succeed in the elite world of international music. The world's largest music group, Universal, signed a long-term contract with Yun Du Li. Yun Di is not only a wonderful musician, a superb pianist, but he's also a great personality. And in fact, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a superstar. He's an international superstar. He's known all over the world. In China, he's a household name. Um, he's an idol for um, young people. They look up to him and they want to be like him. Da Da, who is six years old, is the youngest student in Yun Li's master class. Dodo has been playing the piano for two years. He won gold in this year's Yun De Li's piano competition. Zhang Yuan Fu is another of Yun Duli's students. He is 17 years old and was born blind. Playing the piano brings happiness to Da Da and his mother, but it brings life to Yuan Fu and his mother. He began to learn piano at age eight. His family is not rich. His mother lives frugally to pay for piano lessons. I want to become the next Li Mingdi. I want to go down the music path. My music path is more and more bright. I hope this path is more bright. 希望要再坚持一下租租一个桥斗因为他也没有别的选择每一个小孩子现在有条件的小孩子去接触音乐去学习音乐不一定学习音乐是为了去在舞台上去演奏但是学习音乐更多能够在自己的人生整个过程当中
in that both are challenged by foreign competitors. But is this analysis too simple, archaic? After all, great music is not determined by geography or ethnicity, but by time and history in the free market of human appreciation. Although Chinese people have emerged at the tops of many fields, in architecture, China is still the student. China's major cities, such as Beijing and Shanghai, have been called a proving ground for foreign architects. Take Beijing's Olympic Stadium, the Bird's Nest, and the new CCTV building. More than half of China's large buildings are designed by foreigners. China is attracting talent worldwide. In China today, architectural exchange between East and West is catalyzing radical ideas. Here's the breathtaking Shanghai Tower in Lu Wei, second only to Dubai's Burj Khalifa as the world's tallest building. I meet Marshall Strabala. He used to work for the Gensler architectural firm, which designed the Shanghai Tower. Strabal is world-renowned in designing tall buildings. He also designed Dubai's Burj Khalifa. These are three of the ten tallest buildings in the world. The tallest building, the Burj Khalifa. Yeah. I was the associate partner at Skidmore. Shanghai Tower is number two. The idea was to create the world's tallest double skin building. And a double skin building is like a thermos bottle. So it acts almost like a jacket. In the winter, it keeps the warmth in. And in the summer, it keeps the heat out. By the end of 2015, China will have 10 skyscrapers taller than 500 meters. Attracted by China's vitality, Strabala founded his own company in Shanghai to define architecture. For 30 years, Strabala traveled the world, but ultimately this San Franciscan settled in Shanghai. Each year, he gets several requests to compete for world-class skyscraper projects in China. Well, I've, I started doing competitions in China about 14 years ago. I thought the requirements for the competition were very onerous. We had to do models, we had to do renderings, we had to do plans, we had to do sections. We had to put together a lot of work. And I thought, wow, the Chinese are really good businessmen. They're trying to get a lot of work for a low fee. In 2008, Strabalo's ex employer, Gensler, won the Shanghai Design Competition. Since then, he has been engrossed with every detail of the new baby and looking forward to its birth in 2005. This is a tile. It's a ceramic tile. Okay. There are a lot of opportunities for skyscrapers in China. Skyscrapers are very special. And they work best in cities that are very high density. Shanghai is a very high density city. It needs to go up rather than out. The more it goes out, the more we drive. The more we drive, the more congestion on the streets. The more we go up in the city center, the more people walk. So I think that's why skyscrapers are so important to China, because China is very populous. There's no doubt about that. The world's biggest cities are in China, Shanghai, uh, 23 million or so, Chongqing, 30 million. To see what's so special about the Shanghai Tower, I took a tour with the on-site architect, Xiao Jun. I asked Xiao Jun about the Shanghai Tower's design philosophy. See, here you can see the family now, right? Yeah. The, the older brother, it's a very traditional classic, you know, Chinese architecture pagoda. You know the top is the crown of the emperor, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is uh, you know, another very younger brother, but it's more sharp edge, the facet grows, kind of very slick, you know, so I think it's very, very, very modern. So this is the youngest brother, you know, the little brother. So it's a, it's a most useful feel but it's very dynamic, it's very soft. Beautiful. 
by integrating their distinctive styles into a coherent vision. The three buildings symbolize Shanghai. We hope this tower uh, symbolizes a way we don't have to have a huge burden about history. The, the history and the technology are coming together because the new future. When the Shanghai Tower is complete, its unique double skin exterior will be energy efficient and provide stunning views. Technology and design fuse to exemplify the future. What kind of culture belongs to China? Build on the foundation of traditional culture. Select and integrate the best modern ideas from anywhere. Create novel and lively art forms that pioneer the future. Zhou Shifu, what is the nature of Chinese culture and Chinese civilization? China must transform from an economy built on imitation and low-cost manufacturing to an economy of innovation and value-added production, from made in China to created in China. That's the vision, but here's the reality. Only 6% of Americans can even name one Chinese brand. This is changing. It's a matter of time before Chinese brands will be recognized globally projecting Chinese culture and lifestyle. Mao Ji Hong is the founder of a local clothing design company in Guangzhou. In 2013, his company, Exception, became famous when he was chosen to design clothes for China's first lady, Madame Peng Liyuan, in her diplomatic appearances. Overnight, Mao Jiehong had the world's attention. We the sparse aesthetic of Mao's designs is expressed in the way clothes are displayed in his 100 retail stores across China. We hope to use a kind of Western way to express our environment. It can give a very warm feeling. We actually used three there Shenren, Yoi Shanren, a famous designer in Hong Kong, is Mao Jiehong's friend and partner. When he first saw Mao's designs, he was struck by how different they were from Western design. I saw the whole collection, and I found this is not really Western. Normally, 
those local brands in Hong Kong, most of them is try to be Western, try to be international, try to be follow the trend. Marcus clothes never follow Western, they wear Asian, and uh, also uh, they never his she never follow trend. Uh, this very impressed me. This very to me it's very surprised and unexpected to me. In 2013, China consumed 47% of the world's luxury goods. International fashion companies now depend on the China market. But now China has its own fashion industry with its own designs. It's Shanghai Fashion Week. Thousands of fashion aficionados converge in hip Xin Tian Di to gawk at collections of local and national designers. Fashion has strong appeal in China, but can China become world class in fashion design? Can Chinese cities become fashion centers like Paris and New York? Chinese And it's not just in fashion, but also in fine arts, where China is creating its own contemporary resonance. Gu Wenda is an artist working to break barriers between East and West, offering up Chinese culture and Oriental aesthetics with his special style. Gu graduated from art school in 1981, specializing in Chinese drawing. His first exhibition was held in Xi'an, but even before it opened, it closed. Too controversial. Characters of silence, all silence in different format, and and this has been. Has been the... Twenty-five years ago, Gu Wanda was censored. Today, he's a much lauded celebrity. One masterpiece was the centerpiece of an exhibition at the United Nations. 基本材料呢就是一个用全世界人种的头发来来编制这个作品那就是说把整个世界的文化和世界的那个不同国家的人种包含在我的作品里变成一个世界大团结我们是大一个大家庭 China's modern art is inventive and energetic. What's its future? Can Chinese art have global impact? How to articulate modern art with traditional culture? How to discern enduring innovations and breakthroughs? These are the challenges faced by Chinese artists, 
including Gu Wenda. The China now, in second period, the first period for Chinese contemporary culture was totally imported from the West. This time is kind of a little bit of confusion. You live in a cultural identity crisis because the, the, the things you're familiar is not your, your own, mm -hmm. come from your own. Mm -hmm. You know, it will take time. But eventually, the Chinese tradition will come up as, as, as a platform. Then I think that the third period will be, I was think China will have its own invention in the future. His first attempt was set in a historic city, Foshan, in Guangdong province. With this installation, Guanda merges east and west, printing the phrase filial piety on 2,000 traditional lanterns and doing it all on Mother's Day. In 2009, Gu brought his cross-cultural conversation to Belgium. With a startling installation of 5,000 Chinese lanterns, Heavenly Lanterns Tea House, in the shape of a Chinese pavilion. Gu uses the Red Lantern as a kind of cultural ambassador. Now, after more than two decades in the U.S., Gu has shifted his cultural focus back to China. One thousand and sixty elementary school students join Gu in this public art day event, representing a classic Chinese literary work on filial piety, Xiao Jing. Gu's ambition is to bring Chinese culture to China, but in a new way, with new meaning. To teach children that contemporary art can be radiantly Chinese, not a Western imitation. Gu envisions a new era of cultural exchange, where, through the arts, China begins to influence the West. So what does it mean for China to be a civilization state? To entrepreneur Qin Ji Hui, it means appreciating China's ancient values and applying them in a hyper-commercial, globalized world. To pianist Yun De Li, it's being world-renowned as a Chinese concert artist and bringing Western classical music to China and its children. To architect Marshall Strabala, it's building a magnificent edifice that optimizes technologies and harmonizes spirits of East and West. To fashion designer Mao Jihong, it's creating stunning, stylish clothes and making China into a fashion center. To artist Gu Wenda, it's reaching deeply into Chinese culture and creating original symbols of universal meaning. To all of them, for China to be a civilization state, 
means building on what China has been and constructing what China can be. President Xi puts forth the grand vision of the Chinese dream as the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. That rejuvenation must include a profound and continuing sense of China's civilization and culture. To realize the Chinese dream, China must be a civilization state. Thank you.